teachers, new teachers, experienced teachers, people who are curious about teaching, about teaching languages. If you're one of these people, then this video is most definitely for you. Hi, I'm Brendan. I am a language teacher with quite a few years of experience <laughs> um, around the world. And I wanted to make this video. It's the second video of a teacher check-in series because I've noticed um, not only in my experiences, but I notice how important it is to check in with teachers to to have that moment of you know what's going on how are you how is everything going and really just have that sort of one on one or <laughs> depending on how many viewers I have one on five hundred million <laughs> check in um, talk about things that teachers experience talk about difficulties, struggles, challenges, opportunities, um, positive things, resources, and to have that sort of open, open and honest communication uh, between teachers. You know, we get into, I guess we get, I guess sometimes we get into our heads a little bit about, uh, about teaching and about, you know, what we can do, how can we make a difference in the lives of the children that we teach? The people that we teach, the retirees, the CEOs, the children, the the adults, the, uh, the university students. I mean, there is such a wide range of, of people that we can teach as, as language teachers. And that's what this that's what the series is about. So buckle in, because today we have a, <laughs> something completely new and very exciting. So without further ado, let's get into it. I want to take a second. I'm going to leave this this up a little bit so we can have a little bit of... Uh, <laughs> I love having that cozy ambience because nothing works better. Nothing makes us feel more comfortable than sitting in front of a fireplace. And, you know, hopefully that, that <laughs> inspires some thought for me today as uh, I sit here and lecture you about, uh, <laughs> about something I'd like to talk about. And that is check-ins. So last, last time we talked a lot about confidence. We talked a lot about check-ins, about what can we do to check in with our students. And, you know, overall it was, it was a nice conversation, but it stayed rather abstract. And so for today, I wanted to give you a sort of outline that I use and that I modify, edit for each of my students, um, especially, especially, especially business students. I use it a lot with my business students. It works a lot. It works very, very well for business students, and it allows them to make sure that they stay on top of their objectives. And but let's get into it. Let's talk about it a little bit. So I'll just go ahead and switch my screen here, and we'll take a look. I'll make myself a little bit smaller. There we go. This is an outline. I will give you the link in the description below. This is an outline I created. Uh, well, it says the fifth of November, but it's something I created many, many years ago. Um, with one of my first, I uh, started off actually, started off with middle school students. If you can believe that, I started off with middle school students who were, we started off with native speakers and slowly I changed the language, I graded the language to make sure that it was adapted and it was understandable, <laughs> getting into comp comprehensible input. It was understandable by you know, students of all of different levels. And I think it's, it's quite easy to do, but let's get into it first before we get into how we can adapt it. So this check-in has three main parts that the student gets into, the student talks about. And at the end, these sort of questions, these three questions at the end are questions that, um, that, come, that can, oh, sure, there's a space there, but these are questions that can be discussed one-on-one -on -one with the teacher, with you, with, um, if you have a student teacher, this is something a student teacher could also take into effect and then report back to you as a teacher. But let's get into it. The first part is more getting a, getting a sense of the student's thoughts about English. You know, let's say that it's been a very long time since you know, the last class. I, you know, one thing that might be <laughs> might allow you to better adapt to better personalize your classes to the needs of your students is understanding well during that time what happened 
since the last class, since, you know, since last, before last summer, what happened? You know, what has, the, what has the student done? What has the student not done? How is the student feeling? Is there any nervousness? Is there any anxiety? Here we're getting a little bit into um, uh, self-efficacy. Self so we're talking a lot about Pandora and a lot about empathetic, uh, empathy-based learning, the mixture of the two here. So what I usually do is once a month, or at least once every six months, depending on the frequency of the classes. I am currently doing this with a business student. She is a, um, she's a manager, a supervisor at a company here in France. And one thing that she, and we haven't had class for ooh, months. I think our last class was December of last year because it's, it's, you know, there have been a few things that have happened and, you know, she needed to go back to her country and everything. And so this is something that we read that I asked her to do at least the first part before we get into our next class. This way I can have a sense of where we're going, what our trajectory could be, not really should be, but what our trajectory for the course, for the class should be next time. So one of the, one of the first things to start off with is I always start off with something positive. You know, we all know the method PSB, positive suggestion, positive, it's a sandwich method basically. And one thing I really like to start off with is, you know, when we get these questionnaires of, you know, how are you doing? What did you work on this summer? What did you do? You know, it's, 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 everyone knows this. It's, it's, it's quite, quite common. I know, I know at least I received this every single year at the beginning of the year and, you know, going from fifth grade to last year of primary school, all the way into high school and even into college, into university, excuse me. But the questions were more were, were direct, you know, were very, very direct. They were based on what have you done, what have you not done, and what uh, what do you need to work on. So it, it's really it's really production based, you know, getting this getting the student into a sense of uh, <laughs> basically a capitalist sense of thinking, <laughs> if I can be blunt about that. No, it's it's I mean it worked. It helped me to it helped me to organize myself to develop those skills to allow myself to organize myself and uh, myself to um, to prepare for you know the year to come it works however it didn't it didn't really give me the chance to it there wasn't any input from me it didn't ask me it didn't elicit any input from me about how I'm feeling about the year am I nervous about the year am I excited do I feel confident in my English do is there anything I can is there anything specific that that blocks me from going there and you know, students when they're when they're going through this, they don't have to respond in full sentences. It's I mean, it, it depends on your expectations, of course, <laughs> and uh, what your needs are. But the students don't exactly need to answer in full in full sentences. I mean, that's something you can do to adapt. But basically, lately or recently, you know, I know recently is lately is not a word that is the easiest for my students here in France to understand. So I always give them a, a second option. What have you succeeded at? What are some of your past successes? It can be successes in English. It can be successes in using English for a different thing. Try to get them to connect it back to the, the lesson. If they don't, that's okay. Giving them, eliciting those successes, getting from them what, the, what their successes are, gives you a positive foot to start off from, positive base to start off from, start off on, excuse me. And that's, that's, it, it allows you to create a connection, the positive memory, which allows you to make their learning more positive, make it more based on their confidence, the fact that I've done this, I can do something more you know, with this. And there's also one thing, and this is, this is really my style of teaching, is it's, it's to go a little bit further. I learned this from, um, uh, from a teacher when I was teaching in the south of France. And that's the word extrapolation. I had no idea what this word was before. <laughs> Shout out to Deborah. <laughs> but this is um, this is one thing that I've I've and I've been engulfed in my teaching, and that is going one step further. Not just asking what they what they've accomplished, what their successes are, but what made that possible. What were some things that made that possible? Now this is a very clever question because. It allows you to have an inside look 
into what helps the that student, this is that student, learn. What enables learning for that particular student? You see, by understanding where the successes come from, that, that source can become something that is replicated in your classes. So let's, we're, we're, it's pretty, it's pretty, um, it's pretty abstract here. Let's see if we can add something. So lately, recently, what have you succeeded at? Uh, what have I succeeded at? Da, 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 Oh, geez. Okay. So today, <laughs> it's, it, the, I am so proud of myself for this, but, uh, it has nothing to do with English teaching, but English learning and teaching, but I'll give it to you anyway. Today, I was able to remove all the mold uh, me, in my apartment. So mold, uh, if for, uh, I'm not sure if all of you know what this is, but when it, when the apartment gets really, really wet, gets really humid, there's water in the, in the air, sometimes there are little black spots, black things that stick on the ceilings and the walls. After three years of <laughs> looking for solutions, I finally went to um, a painter and I, I, I had a, a friend who's a painter and he told me, it's going to give me, of course, the British English. Yeah, it's going to give me the British English here. We're going to ignore this. But um, we had, I had a, paint, a friend who's a painter who came, took a look at it and said, oh, Brendan, you're doing everything right, but you're missing one step. And that one simple step was to add a, was to create a solution of bleach, javel in French, bleach and water. Mix that together, make it mostly water as well, certain measurements that, that were needed. Mix that together and then use a, um, I'm not sure how we call that, we call it a scour or a score. Anyway, it's a, it's a very hard kind of a sponge made of metal or plastic that has those little rings that are connected, you know, sort, sort of in a ball. You use that and you and you scrub it on the wall. And so for four to six hours today, <laughs> I went all, I went hard going through all the rooms and using that. And then I used a microfiber rag and washed the way. And let me tell you that just when that mic, when that rag, the microfiber rag wiped away, the uh, the bleach wiped away the water from the wall, and I saw the mold just disappear. Man, that was one of the most. <laughs> that was oh, it was an out of body experience. <laughs> Let me tell you, I was so ex I was so excited, so excited because now I have a mold free home. So today I was able to remove all the mold in my apartment. That was the success. And what made that possible? There were a lot of things that made that possible. But first of all, I, I, I asked, uh, honestly, I asked a painter to come and, um, and take a look. So basically I, I asked for help. Oh, hello. I asked for help. The next thing that happened was, um, he, he told me that I was missing a step, that I was doing well. I was doing, I was doing a good job, but I was missing a step. Bleach, the bleach solution. I was doing everything else except for the bleach solution. Now, of course, bleach solution, just you caveat, bleach solution only takes away the, <laughs> The, the mold from the outside. It doesn't take away the mold from the inside. So be careful when you're doing that. There were other steps that I took as well. Um, he told me that I was doing well, but I was missing a step. And the last thing was when I put it, uh, what made this impossible? What else did I do that made this impossible? Those are the main things. Those are the main things. I mean, we can get into other sources that made these possible, other, other things that made these possible, such as the fact that um, I also went to the supermarket and I asked the people's opinion. I asked the opinion of someone who um, actually just bought a house, very luckily. But the, 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 the gist is here, and that is that I asked for help. And I found out by asking for help, I realized that I was missing a step. I was doing everything correctly, but I was missing a major step that allowed the mold to disappear. Now, 
had I not asked myself this question, what made these successes possible? What is the source? Or the, what are the sources of the, of the success? I might not have known exactly how this happened. It's great. I was able to remove all the mold in my apartment. That tells me the end result, but it doesn't tell me how I got to that result. It doesn't tell me how the student arrived at these successes, what the student needed to be able to go from problem to a solution. What was the actionable step that the student took to go from the problem to the solution, to go from the conflict to the solution? So that's one that's one thing we can we can talk about here. I'll keep this here just just in case. Uh, what I can do is I'll take out the word outline here. I I added another one here for you as well. I'll put outline. Nope. Outline here. So feel free to to copy to to do what you need um, with this. I'll keep this as an example. For example. Okay. So moving forward, we've talked about uh, what the student was successful at and what help the student to arrive at that, at, that, at that point. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about confidence. You know, this is when we talk about language teaching. And listen, we, we talked about this last time with imposter, imposter syndrome. Confidence is, is, is really a, a huge key to, to teaching, to successful teaching, to successful learning, to, to, to bridging the gap between I can't do it, and damn, I did it. <laughs> so there's, there's a, sometimes it's, it's just a small thing that allows us to bridge that gap and to allow us to move into the next unit, move into the next, into the next uh, skill skill set. And that for me is confidence. I mean, I'm, I've seen lots of teachers who lack that confidence. But once they start to really put themselves in the question, to really think about where it is that. You know, basically give themselves that self-feedback. Uh, we'll talk about that in a later one because I have a lot of resources for you when it comes to feedback. They start to realize exactly what is, you know, where that lack of confidence comes from and what they can work on. And they have these actionable steps they can take to work on confidence. So here's one thing. It's 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 quite simple. It's sort of a what I feel confident in. It's it to be completely honest. It's it's not too different from this. <laughs> the <laughs> I'm gonna. I, I love the name capitalist feedback. I, a capitalist questionnaire. I love that name. I think it's so funny. But it's not so. It's not that different from the capitalist questionnaire that I would receive back in my back in my past, where you know, what am I okay with? What do I need to work harder on? And already, already the fact that work hard on it. <laughs> we have that uh, we have that work hard, work hard makes a dream work, <laughs> that kind of thing. But what do you what does the student feel confident in? What are some aspects of of language? What are some aspects that maybe the student worked, studied really, really hard of, uh, on something? Maybe the student had an epiphany and you know was able to move past. Uh, a roadblock they had the last time you taught them. What do they feel confident in? And this idea of working hard, working harder on, this is something that can also lead to more discussion. Maybe the student has very few things here and a lot of things here. And in that case, I would translate in my head, I would translate it right there their understanding is what am I perfect in and what do I, where are my mistakes? Where are my errors? Where am I wrong? And that's something I see all the time here, especially here in France, but you know, that's something I see all the time, honestly, in language, language learning. And you know, we often, we oftentimes fall into that hole of, you know, I'm not perfect at it. I'm not fluent. God, I hate this word. <laughs> I hate this word. <laughs> I'm not fluent. So I can't feel confident in myself. Why? Why not? <laughs> Why not? Where does that come from? It's 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 a myth that I think comes from uh, so many factors, and that's something we'll talk about in a later video because it's not related to this feedback sheet too much. But what we can do concretely when we see that there is little here. And a lot here, 
we can try to balance these things out. So when we have that one-on-one -on -one with the students, when we when, with our student, or um, you know, we can think about, we can listen to the student talk, listen to how the student expresses themselves, and say, okay, so let's. So what I'm understanding, let's say for example, I have student X who feels very confident in grammar, needs but needs more work on. Okay. That's not what I'm looking for at all. I need more work on, they say I need more work on vocabulary. I need more work on pronunciation. I need more work on um, uh, accent. I need more work on stress. I need more work on, you know, they start to create this list. And they focus on one thing and that leads them, that connects, that helps them connect to something else that they think is wrong. Helps them connect to something else. And you know, Especially when we talk to you know middle schoolers, high schoolers, what we're going to hear here, what we're going to hear in this place is the are uh, basically the four the four main skills of course where you're going to hear ah oh, I'm good I'm good at listening I'm good at um, I'm not good at speaking I'm good at writing I'm not so good at reading. I, I doubt they're going to include the fifth, which is interaction, the fifth comp of this skill. But these are basically what we're going to hear here, what we'll see the students talk about here. What we can add, and this is something that will really boost the confidence of the students, is to really add that aspect of, huh, switch back to Kaleem here, but is to add that, that aspect of, of, of soft skills. But what are some soft skills? What are some what are some strategies that the student is using to be able to to be able to formulate these sentences? Is the student a strong speaker? A strong um, uh, does the student, for example, does the student have strong organizational skills? Does the student um, does the student articulate clearly? what they what the, what they say what they what they need does the student lead well does the student have natural leadership qualities leadership abilities does the student mm, is the student optimistic that's one thing i that's one thing that's that i think is so important is to have this optimistic point of view it's important to be pessimistic on the other hand to be able to be more realistic. Also, it's all it's important to be optimistic in, in a sense. It's important to have this, this sort of optimistic skill, a skill of being, of being optimistic. So this way they are more <laughs> I guess we can say the dreamers in a sense. Yeah, they they they're able to to take a to take what could be a banal task. I'll write this down. Take a banal task and make it extraordinary. Extra, extraordinary. Um, extraordinary. Uh, of course, I didn't. There we go. I'll be out there. Make it extraordinary. And like I said, it's also. I think it's also important. Is the student more realistic as well? That's that's another thing we just talked about. Does the student have have good interpersonal skills? Does the student, you know, are they able to get along with others, get along well with others, work well in a team, work well in a group? Are they able to delegate tasks, delegate uh, tasks? I'm trying to think of what else I what else I've put here in the past. Mm. Ah, one thing that's important for for languages is, are they good code switchers? Um, uh, I'll put this like this. You're good at code switching. Now, for those who, who uh, I'm sure that everyone knows what this word means, but maybe they haven't heard it in this sense. Code switching is the ability to, to switch from one language, dialect, accent to another. You know, I use it a lot in my, in my region of the U.S. because the way that I'm talking right now is a lot more city-based. It's something that you, something that I would, something, the way I would talk in the city, but it's not the way I would talk with my family at all. <laughs> it's, it's a lot more, um, 
It's a lot more precise. I take those, as we say, I take those Obama pauses where I just, and then I continue. <laughs> I take a second to collect my thoughts and continue. Um, but it's not the way that I would speak with my family. You know, there's a different sort of, there's a different way I would speak uh, when I speak to my family, when I speak with my friends. That's more of a minor code switching, but we can also say, are they, are they good at switching between different languages? Are they able to take an idea? Are they able, are they good at taking an idea in one language and not translating it because it's not really what we're looking for, but um, but translating the idea into what would be native native like language? You know, here are just some some I, I put this as soft skills. I mean, some of these are, are harder skills, but you know, we can also talk about hard skills as well here, but. Here are just some things, some ideas for other ways that we can, that we can, other things we can put in confidence, in the confidence section. Because when we have those one-on-one -on -one with the students, I remember in the past, you know, it's, it can, it can get quite, quite intense emotionally, you know, because we're, we're getting into, we're creating a connection between the language that we're teaching. So in my, in my case, English and the heart at the core of the student. And so if we if we connect the the language to just these five measurable competencies, five measurable skills, and then the fifth one, which is not usually used, <laughs> the five we focus on these four measurable skills, you know, it kind of puts students into a box. And of course it's ironic because here I am making boxes, but it maybe puts students into a box and makes them feel that if they aren't able to to achieve these four, if they aren't as good, if they aren't perfect, even, you know, we have that comparison culture, if they aren't perfect at these four skills, then they can't feel confident in these four skills. Which of course is BS. <laughs> of course. I mean there's so there's so many ways that we can feel confident in ourselves, and there's so many things that we can feel confident about. Because English is not only about, or, you know, and languages are not only about listening, speaking, writing, and reading. Listen, I'm very, very confident in my, I'm very, very confident in my listening, speaking, writing, and reading in French. However, there's, I'm only confident in, in, in speaking, which for me is, is the hardest in French, because I'm very organized, because uh, articulate clearly, I'm not sure, <laughs> because I'm optimistic. I, I'm able to to be creative about different things. I have good interpersonal skills. I know how to delegate tasks. I know how to code switch because I do it with my family. Because of these soft skills, these sources of success, because of these soft skills, I am able to to say that I am confident in my speaking when it comes to French. I'm able to feel confident when I interact in French. You see. I'm giving you small ideas of things that we can add here, but you know, don't hesitate to add others. If you see that the student is is doing a great job, doing even a good job um, at something, at something that's that's maybe they maybe wouldn't think about. And let, let's say, oh, you're you're very very good at helping others. You're very good at simplifying tasks. Add that into this, you know, having the student have a sort of not list, but I guess toolbox of all of, of all of the things they feel confident in and the things that their teacher sees that they're confident in teacher sees that they're good at Come on. that's it's it's such it's such a nice it's such a nice thing to have honestly it's such a nice thing to, to, to look back on to have that sort of that sort of list of all the things that they're good at and you know Maybe they need more work on vocabulary, pronunciation, accent, stress. Maybe they need more work on uh, mixed conditionals. I, man, if you have a student who's, who's who wrote mixed conditionals <laughs> in this, you're one hell of a teacher, <laughs> honestly. Because I, uh, I mean, to be honest, I don't know many students who know what this means. You know, I, I it's it's not the it's not the most common thing in the world, but. To give a very specific point, you know, maybe the student has more specific needs. Maybe the student needs help with pitches and things like this. I need to give a business pitch, an elevator speech. You know, this allows you to focus your um, your lessons, and this allows you to have that base 
on which you can build your lessons. We talk about it from a constructivist perspective. This allows you, I feel confident and allows you to know how the student feels about their learning. We add the soft skills, what the student can give, what the student can offer to the lessons that you create. Does that make sense? So when we ask, what do you feel confident in? I'm asked, we're basically creating a list of all the things that the student is feels happy and feels confident in. They, they start off by themselves, of course. And then when you have the one-on-one -on -one with the student, when you talk to the student about what they what they what they do, even if you do this as a class, you know, they, I know teachers don't always have to um, <laughs> I know that we don't always have that much time. <laughs> but even if you do this as a class, you can say Generally, this is what I've seen, and you know, you give back the papers, of course. Generally, this is what I've seen that you you all say that you feel confident in. However, I've also seen that some of you are very good at organizing your skills. Some of you are very good at speaking. Some of you are very good at at working at, at working with others, and you start to add into the minds of your students other things that they can be good at, other things that they can work on, other things they can be proud of in English. And listen, starting off a year like that, you're starting off positive, you're you're setting yourself up for a year, if not, you know, a series of classes if you're more professional, of, um, of, 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 of just pure success, basically. Happiness in the classroom. I mean, of course you're going to have students who you know, once you start this this sort of teaching, um, you start with this sort of with this sort of um, questionnaire. You'll have students who are mm, you start to feel a little bit more connected with you, and so it's important to know that um, it's important to to know just know that for you know depending on what kind of school system you work in, maybe being you know, sitting down with the teacher and having that one on one is not the most common. And so how can you adapt this check-in? And we've only been to the first two parts. How can we adapt this check-in to meet the needs of the culture in which you live, meet the needs of the system in which you work, basically? We'll come back to that. Now, this is something that's very, very important and something to allow them to work on the, to allow your students to work on those organizational skills. And that is to talk about the objective. So. When I transferred this uh, <laughs> this uh, this graph from where I usually create my graphs, the formatting didn't really work. But basically, what are your objectives in future classes? You have a whole box here that you can that they can fill out and they can talk about all the things they want to work on, all the things that they want to they have questions about, for example. And what they basic but what bas what the, what they basically do is they organize, and this is more of a learning method. They organize these objectives into priorities. So they write down all the objectives, all the things they'd like to do, all the things they want to accomplish in the year, and they organize them into the objectives based on their priority. So mm, let's say, I love these teacher check-ins, <laughs> T. <laughs> the most important part of these teacher, these teacher check-ins is the T. Uh, let's say that you know my objectives are to um, to work on what is something I need. We'll work on, for example, my Japanese. Um, is to review the connect more kanji, connect more um, more characters together, write more, write at least one um, paragraph per week, watch one, it, well, so watch, watch two Japanese films per month. You know, we can, we can continue with uh, some more classes, but we, we can continue with all of these objectives. Uh, I focused more on future classes because I 
I created this version was created for, like I said, the business student who um, who, had, who has a more pres- a more professional trajectory. But we could just erase this and just say, what are your objectives for learning English this year? I mean, it's it's very flexible in the way that you address this. As long as you have that first part, so I'll highlight this. As long as you have that first part. The rest of this is modulable. You can you can change this to you can change this to suit your environment, to suit your um, your learning space or teaching space. So my you know I, I focused more on you know we can I'll change this to Japanese, but I I focused more on what I would like to do. So connecting more characters, the hiragana, the the kanas to the kanji write at least one paragraph per week using what I learned in my, in, my, in my weekly lessons to then do something with it. So having that practice, basically, having that, that practice and watch at least two Japanese films per month, having that cultural connections and seeing if I can actually remember <laughs> some, of the, um, some of the past lessons, see if I can connect these things together. I'm a huge connectivist teacher. Huh? So what do you, what, what would be, He's saying, what will be more low priority? What will be more medium priority? What will be high priority? It's, there is no answer to this. It depends on the student. And by seeing what the student puts in high priority and what the student puts in low priority, we can understand, well, actually probably more medium to high priority. We can see what would, what would interest the student more, how the student would find relevance in these classes. You know, because sometimes I, I remember that a lot of students, that, a lot of private students that have had come to me and say, oh, we learned the word for knight in English. We learned the word for, for shield and sword, but I'm never going to be a warrior. I, I don't want to use these words. There are metaphors we can create with that, of course. You know, there are ways that we can use these words. However, it's true that w- what we saw from this example is that the student couldn't find relevance in what they learned and they couldn't they didn't find the relevance to their own lives they couldn't find the relevance to their professional lives to what they want to do with english and that's one thing that we see here is with this you know this this differentiation between low priorities and medium priorities which is very very important of course and high priorities is we start to see where the student organizes their priorities themselves you know where each student organizes their priorities uh, themselves, and it's it gives you another lifeline, basically another buoy <laughs> to know how you can organize your classes. So, for example, connect more characters together is most definitely going to be one of my high priorities. Um, write at least one par- par- paragraph per week. It's it's ambitious. As I've only been learning Japanese for a year and then a semester back in in. Uh, college, it, you know, I'm not going to put too much of an expectation on myself. I'm not going to say, you, I have to do one paragraph per week or else I failed. You know, I'm not going to do that to myself. It's, it's, it would be horrible for my, men, for my mental health, number one. And number two, you know, things happen. I can't always anticipate that it's, it would be possible for me to write one paragraph per week. So I put that in medium priority. And, you know, even for me, I guess, to be completely honest, I would probably only I probably put that in low priority. I put this here, and to be honest, I probably put this in low priority because the point for me is the the most important for me when it comes to these these objectives. It, at least for me, when I'm talking about myself as a learner, is having that connection to real Japanese, having that connection to the real life language. I think it's important to be able to con- it's important for me to be able to connect, you know what I learned in the kanas to what I already know from Chinese and also being able to connect the, <laughs> the different the different pronunciations uh, between Chinese and, and Japanese you know being able to create those connections basically that's a high priority for me medium priority is being able to have those cultural connections low priority is to be able to organize myself so that I can review um, I can review more, 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 more efficiently. 
efficiently. So what do we see here? If, let's say you are my teacher. Let's say you are my teacher. And uh, excuse, my, excuse my chair. I'll lean back a little bit. Let's say you are my teacher. What are some things that we see here? Uh, what, what can we take from this, basically? Here, I see that the, stu that the student is really ambitious, really motivated, really determined to learn more advanced characters, to connect what they know to more advanced characters. So here in this case, I would focus a lot of my lessons and add a certain, add maybe to the end of the lesson or even between, even between the lessons. Okay, here's how we write it in Japanese. But also here is the, if you're interested, here is the, the kanji writing, the kanji character for, for what we just said. There are two ways to write it, of course, and both are completely perfect. Both are completely okay. I'm giving you both because I see that this is something you've asked for. The high priority objectives, what the student's asking for. I watch the Japanese films for a month. The student's asking for cultural cultural connections. What I mean, how can we make films <laughs> getting into my favorite kind of teaching? How can we make films more educational, more pedagogical? How can we include more culture into our lessons? Are there ways that we can connect it to, to outside culture? Are there ways we can connect it to, um, to films that we find online? Are there other ways that we can connect it to YouTube videos? I mean, there are lots of different ways that you can do this. And this, we'll get more into this with learning, um, learning methodologies, but this is this could be a gateway or at least one paragraph per week of getting the students to take away at least five new words from each lesson and use that to create something that's that's imaginative you maybe give them a small prompt and say as long as you use five words you can talk about whatever there are no limits <laughs> you go as crazy as you want to be i know i do that in my in my turkish classes and i love it it's so much fun, so much fun. So these these three things. This is something you put on. You, you can you would basically put on a piece of paper, and you'd ask them to fill it out. At the end, you can maybe you don't have to put this much space in between. You can keep them like like this, and just say that this is these th these questions are things that we'll talk about on a one in a one on one, or these are these are questions that we talk that we'll talk about in um, as a class. But, uh, but you put them you still put them in the in the paper so this way they they think about it and think a little bit about what are you know what are some uh, they basically think about how they would how they would respond to these questions and to be honest I would I would allow them some space this way they can write if they want to I know that I'm someone who would definitely who would definitely want to to respond to this question um, but you know, there are some who just want to think about it. Who want to mull it over in their heads, want to <laughs> let it cook, let it bake in the in the in the brain of it. <laughs> I love this expression. I had a, a French teacher who taught me this expression. I'm not sure if it's English, but <laughs> I know I love using it. The brain of it. So uh, we'll get we'll get to it. We'll get to this last part in a second. But uh, it's basically where I got most of these ideas. Um, basically, who are you in English? You know, it's a very open question. I, I gave I give an example just in case because I know that my student, the one I wrote this, I, I created this for, uh, likes to have a sort of example that she can create her. She can formulate her own um, sentence of, or she can formulate her own sentence from. So this is this is perfect for her. But if if you don't want to, if you don't want it, delete it. Allow allow them to. Uh, I'll make sure I use the right one. There we go. Allow the student to um, to think about it for for themselves. Mm -hmm. Who are you in English? What happens? I mean, it's basically an open question. They answer it however they want. And that's why I keep it as a discussion question because sometimes writing about this, it you know, it can it's it can be kind of confusing. And so thinking out loud, having that sort of out loud brainstorming, allows them to really take all of the ideas they have in their head and to formulate it slowly, slowly, <laughs> that's the key word, slowly into something that's more coherent, something that's more direct. What is, who are you in English? 
what is your worth as an English speaker? And this is something that uh, comes directly from empathy, empathy based learning. And that is rather than saying, you know, where do you go wrong? Where are you wrong in English? We focus on, you know, what is your worth in English? What, what, where you are at this point? What kind, what kind of value are you as an English speaker? How valuable is it? Was uh, <laughs> creating more of a capitalist uh, sort of questionnaire. But here's an example. I'm so determined to learn English. I focus on a positive, a strength. I am determined to learn English. And I think that's important because we focus on something that they are determined to do. So rather than focusing on the person that they are, we focus more on their, the values that they have that push them to learn English. It's, it's, it's similar to asking the question, why do you want to learn English? But rather than, you know, if you say why you want to learn English, you're focusing on their goal. If you say, what is your worth as an English speaker? You connect who they are to their goal. You see? And so they start to create a, they start to create connections, personal connections to that goal, allowing them to feel more motivated, more, more determined. And if you're if you're really really good, <laughs> um, to feel more more confident based on those, uh, based on what they say, and based on how they how they improve. And like I said, it's it's really well. We'll get to this in a second, but it, it's 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 a great question to give out at the beginning of the year because the beginning of your classes, after a long break, a long hiatus um, between your classes. Because it gives it gives a student a chance to check in with themselves. It's what we call the the English check in to see how everything's going, what's what's going on, what's changed, things like that. And we've already sort of talked a little bit about this with our objectives. But what are you determined to achieve? One thing that we that is is very very common, a very common practice in business is to get the get the client to say the thing two times. Okay. So when you say, um, when we say, for example, oh, that's spicy, I like it. When we say, for example, um, uh, the, uh, the client says, uh, you ask the client, for example, you're on the telephone call, you ask the client, oh, so how are you, um, so this is this is my pricing, is this, um, what are you thinking about this? And the client says, I'm, I, I'm sure I want to buy this product. Huh? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I'm sure I want to buy this product. By getting the client to say, to say the thing two times, it gives them more confidence in the decision. It makes them feel more confident about the way that they, um, about, about what, they, what they just said, basically. So giving them this, this, what are you determined to achieve in our classes? By asking them this question, you're basically at telling them, and get, you're basically getting them to take these, these high priority objectives, even middle priority objectives, focus on them and really concretize in their mind solidify in their mind this is what i am determined to do this year this is what i want to do this is what i'm going to do i am determined to do it so they start off they say it first here and they solidify it in their minds here that's a little bit of a psycho psychological experiment <laughs> but it gives them a it gives them a chance and it gives the opportunity to I uh, feel confident and feel like they're making the good decisions, feel determined, motivated, encouraged that what they're doing is the right choice. What they're doing, what they've done, what they will do is the right choice. So that is the that is the entirety of the, the check-in. You know, it took us about an hour to go through it, but you know, this is something the student can complete. And they, it doesn't have to be like I said. It doesn't have to be um, very very long. You don't have to use full sentences like I like I did. But they can use they can use you know expressions they can use words it's you know whatever they feel comfortable adding to this that's that's what that's what's most important. And I gave you I gave you a few things I will leave this in here of course I give you a few things we talked about soft skills um, adding new things with with confidence uh, moving from for example moving from from only giving the end result to also talking about the the actionable steps. That were taking the the sources of these of these successes that allow these successes to happen, allow these successes to um, be realized. 
and we go through objectives, dividing these into by different priorities. It goes a little bit with this, um, it's a little bit connected to this idea, this idea of second brain. Uh, it's a learning method that we use mostly with the, the notion templates. But I mean, there's, there, you can use this on, on a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be on um, using an, an online site. It's the idea of second brain, where rather than you know pushing all of this information and everything in your head, you have a second place that keeps all of this for you. And so you put your objectives here, you divide them into d the different priorities, and it allows you to stay, and by keeping this, this paper, it allows you to stay, it allows the student to stay on track of what, they, what their priorities are. Maybe their priorities will change. And that's something that is important to, to keep, to keep in mind. And, and I guess that's, for me, it's one reason why I like to give the students back their um, the check-in after I read it. It's so this way they can they can develop the check-in. They can continue. They can work on this. They can adapt it and based on the evolution of of the class of their lives. And then this this discussion questions. You know, talking about who are you? What is your worth as an English speaker? Focusing on determination. And then for me, really getting them to nail in to solidify those those um the the their objectives basically what are they really determined to do all this comes from something i have the i have the site here it's transforming education uh, i didn't i didn't take everything from this but i i think it's a great site i'm not sure if i have the uh i have a zoom thing. there we are yeah i have the site down here um it's not uh up 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 up, up there we go and so you have the site right here if you if you want to go take a look at it. It's a great power, it's a great presentation though. But it gives a little bit of difference between self-esteem, self-efficacy, uh, and the growth mindset. You know, three big things in teaching psychology, which uh, will allow you to evolve your questions and push them to the next level. So these are just things that you can you can take a look at. It's it's not something I would give to the students. Of course, this is for you as teachers, but uh, something that may that may that may push your thinking a little bit, it may give you some ideas of ways that you can adapt your teaching to personalize this, the experience of each student. So we'll stop with that. But um, you know, I, I did say at the beginning we talk about adapting this, and to be honest, there are lots of different ways we can adapt this. As language as language teachers, we can focus on changing the language. We can grade grade the language um, to meet the to meet the level at which the student is maybe the students here and not here the students way over here and not here and so you grade the language to meet their 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 comfort level plus one if you want if you want to if you want to go with that as well um, other things that you can do like I, like I said before um, one of my students the student I, I created this for uh, really likes to have an example sentence this way she can formulate her own sentence from it so maybe you can have an example here different objectives that you, that, they, that can they can think of it allows them to have a, a point to kickstart from you know a, uh, a, a few ideas that allow them to brainstorm their own ideas from that basically it allows them to start their thinking because Listen, if your class is at eight, is at well, like for me, if your class was at seven fifteen in the morning, uh, like I had some of my Latin classes, it was. Uh, <laughs> so these students are gonna need uh, are gonna need something, yeah, something to wake them up. Number one, but also something to um, to help them to um, and to brainstorm. Because at seven fifteen in the morning, my brain is not awake. At, at noon, my brain is not awake. 2 p.m. My brain is starting to get there, so <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll um, you know anything you can do to to ease it for them because the goal for this is not for it to be a comprehension activity. This is not a comprehension activity. You can I really it depends on what you want to do with it, but this is more this is a checkup. This is a, a way for students to to be open and honest and transparent with you and talk about what they need what they want what their hopes are what their feelings are what their confidence level is 
about their learning, especially learning a language. And so anything you can do to make it not too easy because you don't want it to be baby, you know, you don't want to baby your students, but um, anything you can do to make this more accessible, more available, more, um, I'm not, I guess, easy, but more accessible to your students, that it will definitely, it will definitely make all the difference. You'll see a big difference between, you know, having students say, I feel confident in grammar and I need to work on this. And you'll have students giving you specific examples and things and things like that. So we'll stop with that for today. Uh, I'll go back to my, <laughs> to my little, <laughs> my little pumpkin, uh, a crackling fireplace sound. And there we go. So that's what we talked about today. We talked a little bit about um, check-ins. Last time we talked about check-ins for teachers. Now we're talking a lot more, giving you a concrete example about um, how we can effectuate this, this check-ins with students. So if you like this video, if you, if you want more videos like this, if you have any questions, go ahead and post in the comments below. I will be more than happy to, to talk to you, to respond, to, um, yeah, I can move myself over here. There we go. To to talk to you, to to respond to your questions, to even create a new video based on some some ideas that you have. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you again, and have a great day. Bye.